Um, okay. Can you just give, just uh, put in a thumbs up emoji or give some indication in chat that you can see my screen, the, the PowerPoint that should say SIGGRAPH parentheses middle school varsity. Can, can everybody see that? Uh, all right. I'm getting two thumbs up and no apparent thumbs down or messages to the contrary, so I will start. Um, so today, Alicia and I are going to talk about the middle school varsity AF. Oh, is there a message in chat? Yep. Okay. Right. So today we're going to talk about the cyber affirmative uh, for use by middle school, for use in the middle school varsity and uh, high school uh, open divisions. So I had a couple of disclaimers before I get started. Firstly, we're going to split this sort of into two sections. I'm going to be talking about the case arguments, right? What, do, what is the affirmative argument and what are sort of the on-case responses to that by the negative? And Alicia will be covering some of the disads or we'll be covering the disads that respond specifically to this affirmative. Um, the other thing is that we're not going to be covering uh, either the counterplan or the critique uh, for, this for this lecture, for this DDC. So don't worry about that um, for today. So before I get in to talking about this, um, as a general soapbox, why uh, is it a good idea to read about a new affirmative, right? Well, for starters, it helps you sort of like better know about the topic, right? Like one app gets one slice of the topic, one sort of narrow focus on the core controversy, whereas multiple or at least more than one different affirmatives uh, would help you sort of gain more understanding about like what is exactly the core controversy the topic is exploring. And in this case, it's about like what the US should do if the US wants to work more with NATO on any given like technological aspect. Um, and the other thing is e even if you end up deciding that you do not want to read this affirmative, you don't have any particular interest in this, if you're a 2A or a second affirmative speaker, that doesn't mean that the second negative speaker or when you'll have negative debates, that doesn't mean other people won't read this. So it's just a good idea to have some general idea about what this AF says so you can better respond to it. And then sort of the third reason for, for me at least is that I think it's more fun to have different strategic options in the same way that it's, um, let's say that you're good at chess, but you're only really good at playing one opening. And if you learn a different opening, or if you learn that same opening, but on a different side of the chessboard, then that just makes the game more fun because you have more tools in your toolkit. Um, so that's why I think it's important to sort of talk about uh, new affirmatives and why there is a sort of second affirmative um, in the packet. All right. So before, so the way this is going to get struck, the way is this, I'm going to structure this is first I'm going to talk about some key concepts um, going into this app, and then I'll be doing some close reading uh, of the evidence, uh, specifically the evidence from the first affirmative constructive and the first negative constructive. And then I will open the floor to any questions. So I'm going to start with some key concepts. So um, there are three things that I think you should know or be somewhat familiar with going into this. Um, firstly is Article 5. So NATO, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is sort of a military alliance in the North Atlantic region. Um, and part of that military alliance was a founding treaty uh, for our purposes, the most important part of that is Article 5. Article 5 of NATO's treaty says that essentially uh, when one NATO member country gets attacked, then all of the others should come to its sort of collective defense, right? That NATO, Article 5 says that NATO should act as a group in terms of like defending itself. The second sort of concept going in is what is called uh, red line or red lines. And the basic concept here is what is the threshold or what is the like sort of level of attack that would trigger Article 5, right? Like if you, I, I don't know, if you like attacked, if you attacked a, a NATO member country like militarily full scale invasion, yeah, that would trigger Article 5, but like would calling, I don't know, the French president me names on Twitter, would that 
uh, results in an Article Five invocation, it probably it probably won't, and it and it shouldn't. So a red line is essentially saying what is the level of attack that would trigger an Article Five response. And then the third concept um, is democratic peace theory, or DPT for short. And the basic idea here is that it's sort of a theory by social scientists that says that on, on balance, democracy is a more peaceful form of governance than other alternatives, and that specifically uh, authoritarian or anti-democratic systems of government or systems of government uh, characterized by anti democratic norms or what have you are more likely to go to war. So basically it's better for world peace if more countries are democracy, or at least uh, that countries aren't backsliding into authoritarianism. So those are sort of some key concepts going in that we're gonna be exploring in a lot of depth um, for this particular affirmative that are is not sort of the same set of concepts um, that you would, not really the same set of concepts as opposed to the pandemic affirmative. So now I'm gonna sort of go through the 1AC and try to read through each piece of evidence um, and sort of tell you what are the important arguments or important lines you should take from those pieces of evidence on the packet. Um, so starting with this first Frydenberg, Frydenborg, I'm not really sure how to, how to pronounce that. So this card is a card being the unit of evidence, right? This um, Frydenberg uh, card says that NATO currently does not have any clear red lines for cyber attacks. And what that means is that there's, it's not really super clear either to adversaries or to NATO member states what type of cyber attack would trigger an Article 5 response. Because hypothetically, if an attack was big enough or important enough, it would trigger an Article 5. But like, there have been cyber attacks on NATO member countries, you know, in the past, and none of them have triggered Article Five. So it's a question of how bad does an attack need to be before it would trigger a collective self-defense measure. So Frydenberg takes the position um, that Russia, in particular, has taken advantage of this sort of unclear, ambiguous um, Article Five stance with respect to cybersecurity so that it can sort of cyber attack NATO member countries um, with impunity because there's not really a clear sort of understanding of what would trigger an Article 5 response. Uh, the second piece of Frydenberg card, or the second Frydenberg card um, is sort of the, as the name would, or as the labeling would suggest is the solvency piece of evidence that says that uh, expanding or clarifying Article 5 to include cyber attacks and not just like physical attacks with like guns and tanks uh, would be good because it would deter uh, Russian aggression. And deterring would mean, deterring in this context just means it would convince, um, it, would, it would convince Russia that cyber attacking NATO is more risky than it would be beneficial, right? If you know that there's going to be some sort of reprisal by NATO for a cyber attack, you're probably not going to you're not probably not going to cyber attack NATO. That is Frydenberg's uh, sort of core argument. Um, next is the Pearson and Landay evidence. So this sort of covers ground we've already talked about that currently there are sort of some unclear cyber red lines and that. Uh, Ru and that Russia is taking advantage of that. Um, the two things I think are maybe important with regards to this piece of evidence that don't apply to the other uh, pieces of evidence that we've already talked about are one, this cites um, US Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner. So there's like a direct government source if that's uh, an important uh, rhetorical point for your judge. And then two, it says that quote, a massive Russian cyber attack becomes even more dangerous with Putin elevating the readiness of his nuclear weapons. So the idea there is, well, what if the cyber, an offensive cyber attack is like paired with some sort of nuclear offensive by Russia or by Putin. The next card, the, the next card is the O'Connor evidence. And this says that um, 
And basically a lack of clarity and ambiguity in cyber red lines is bad. The idea is that there is no one formal red line that people know not to cross, um, but that at some point a cyber attack would get too costly or too disastrous for NATO and that at some point they'd be forced to respond and that would sort of trigger a potential war with Russia. Basically that if the red line is not clear, then there's always a risk that somebody will accidentally force uh, NATO's hand, even if they don't really mean to trigger uh, a NATO defensive response. Um, the other card is, or another card, the next card is the Healy evidence, um, which says that sort of outlines the process that I was just talking about and says that NATO and Russia could be sort of trapped in a series of escalating cyber operations because there's, again, no clear understanding of what exactly, what exact action or what exact set of actions uh, would trigger a formal reprisal by the other. And uh, Healy argues that this sort of process of mutual escalation could result in a direct conflict between uh, Russia and NATO, especially if Putin is convinced that cyber attacks are sort of no cost offensive options because they would not trigger Article 5. And obviously, war between the United States and Russia would be bad, which is why this is your uh, impact uh, argument. So what I just talked about was the advantage or was the solvency, the inherency, and sort of the first advantage, which was all about preventing a war between the US and Russia uh, from cyber attacks. So these next, I think, two pieces of evidence are separate advantage about democracy. And you could sort of think about this as a more specific explanation of how Russia uses offensive cyber operations. The Hunt card says that Russia specifically uses cyber attacks to disrupt democratic elections, and it lists a couple of examples. But that sort of the broader reason why that is important um, is that uh, cyber attacking uh, democratic elections uh, would make them sort of not, the public would not necessarily be as confident in public and Democrat uh, in elections as they otherwise would be, and that it could uh, result in a rise of authoritarianism and anti-democratic and anti-democratic uh, politicians or policies being passed. So diamond is the impact, uh, the impact part of this advantage. And this just says that authoritarianism is on the rise and that uh, increase of authoritarianism will cause an increase in worldwide conflict because referring again to the democratic peace theory stuff I was just talking about, um, that democracy, diamond subscribes to the idea that democracies are inherently sort of more peaceful um, than authoritarian countries. So if that's the case, um, then it would be a bad thing if there were more authoritarian countries because it would make more likely war or otherwise uh, international conflict, which is obviously a bad thing and something that the app wants to avoid. So how would we answer this case? That is, um, answered by the sort of one and C set of evidence. Now, before I go into this, I will just mention if you're reading along in the packet, this will be somewhat out of order. Uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be explaining the I think solvency term last, and I'm going to be covering sort of the other arguments first. So first, I'm going to cover sort of the defensive arguments, and then I'm going to get into the term. So starting with the Davis card. Davis says that uh, the status quo is solved, right? That NATO already includes cyber into Article 5, and that NATO and that NATO allied leaders have reiterated the commitment and said that um, we will invoke Article 5 in response to a cyber attack. So obviously, the reason that this is an important argument is if cyber red lines are already in place, then there's no, that, then the rest of the AFS arguments don't make any sense because if cyber red lines are already in place, there's no reason why Russia would be cyber attacking NATO member states or disrupting democratic elections. The next card um, 
the Mashemeyer and Kostyuk evidence, I'm probably mispronouncing that, um, so forgive me if I am, um, is the uh, one, one of the core answers to that first advantage, right? That's it, that the AFS argument is that Russian cyber attacks caused, would eventually cause war between NATO and the US versus Russia, and, and that cyber warfare would be the sort of direct cause of this. Uh, this piece of evidence says that that is in fact not the case that cyber war in general, cyber war or cyber attacks generally aren't that beneficial to Russia and it's not a tool or an option that Russia exercises frequently. And it also doesn't sort of fit into Russia's broader strategic logic, especially in the context of the current conflict in Ukraine. Um, the last uh, piece of evidence I'll talk about before getting into the turn is sort of the no impact argument. Um, against the democracy advantage. And this says that democratic peace theory or GPT is in fact incorrect. So there are a lot of different arguments that Larison, that Larison uses to sort of support his, to support their points. Um, but essentially um, that one democratic peace theory is, uh, has a really narrow historical focus. If democratic peace theory is a historical argument, then the window of history that it draws its, its, its examples from is a very narrow slice of the 20th century and doesn't sort of talk about parts before or after that. So for example, ancient uh, democracies from antiquity would often go to war with each other, um, which democratic peace theory would say was would not have happened. And also that democracies have gone to war past the primary point where DPT draws its examples from. Um, and then sort of the second uh, sort of broad theme of Larison's argument is that it the system of governance doesn't super matter when it comes to going to war because the public can be convinced uh, that a war is necessary or that a war is desirable for a lot of different reasons. But essentially going to war is not something that democracies are uniquely equipped to prevent because they are still subject to public pressure and public pressure can always be pro-war instead of pro-peace. Um, so those are sort of all of the non-turn arguments. So I'm gonna start talking about the turn now. So uh, just a little, to go a little bit into sort of debate theory, um, the turn or case turn is a type of argument that tries to turn the AF against itself. And by that, I mean, it's saying that the AF is trying to do something to solve an impact. But in this instance, right? Oh, somebody, sorry, somebody just turned on their video. Um, but that, in fact, the way the AF goes about trying to solve its impact makes that impact more likely, right? Let's. Uh, like, let's say if you were, I don't know, trying to walk down the, trying to walk down the street um, or try to go to the grocery store to get groceries um, because you were hungry. And then all of a sudden you get more hungry by the time you get to a grocery store and the grocery store is in fact closed by the time you get there. Uh, you have ended up making yourself hungrier than you otherwise would have been if you did not go to the grocery store and instead ordered out from a restaurant or, or had leftovers or something. Um, so essentially the turn is a type of offensive argument that you would use against an affirmative in a way that those other arguments I was just talking about um, are not offensive. These are primarily defensive arguments that are saying the bad thing that the abscess has happened that the F says would happen would not happen. The turn is a type of argument that says the bad thing is bad, um, but that the F actually makes it more likely uh, than not, or at least makes it more likely than the status quo, uh, or at least more likely than the status quo. So going into the turn, the general argument behind this turn is that the F actually makes war or conflicts between NATO and Russia more likely um, than it otherwise would be. And there are three different um, pieces of evidence to support this claim. Um, the first is this Lonergan and Moeller uh, card. And this essentially is saying that changing Article 5 to include cyber attacks would 
of risk damaging Article 5's credibility, that the only reason that Article 5 is important is because adversaries and NATO member countries and allies think that Article 5 is credible, that uh, NATO would follow up on Article on Article 5 trigger by, you know, by launching a collective self-defense operation. Uh, Lonergan and Mueller also say that NATO member states wouldn't necessarily agree on a cyber threshold. And that just basically means not everybody would necessarily agree on what is the exact level or exact or exact red line that should trigger an Article 5, um, uh, should trigger an Article 5 response. Let's say that one country says cyber attacking, uh, cyber attack, attacking a hospital or a hospital network should be sufficient to trigger Article 5, should be sufficient to trigger Article 5. And then another country says, no, that that should not be sort of the red line we put in place, right? And if there's an argument uh, within NATO about what constitutes an, or what should constitute an Article 5 trigger, that would be sort of, again, bad for Article 5 credibility. Um, and that the plan in general just would fracture the alliance. And obviously if the alliance is fractured, then it wouldn't be able to stand up to Russian cyber attacks. Um, the second the second card to support this argument is in another uh, article or another part of an article um, from Davis in 2019. And this essentially says that ambiguity, in fact, is a good thing, or that ambiguity is not a bad thing, and is in fact a good thing. The argument being that ambiguity makes enemies sort of more cautious about potentially crossing a, a red line or about causing a bad enough attack, because if they don't know where that line is, they'll always try to minimize their, minimize the severity of their attacks, right? They'll always try to make them not so bad. Um, and it also says that uh, policy of ambiguity uh, works uh, during the Cold War, not necessarily for cyber specifically, but in general, like an ambiguous, um, what exactly would trigger Article 5 or what would trigger a response uh, generally work during the Cold War. That's another argument that Davis makes. Um, Davis also says that um, clarifying Article 5 and establishing a hard red line that says this is the type of action that would trigger an Article 5 response says that that would, in, instead of discouraging attacks, instead of it would instead encourage attacks that would go below the threshold or just below the threshold. The idea being that Russia would, Russia or any enemies of NATO would continuously cyber attack NATO in ways that almost but not quite reach uh, the threshold that NATO has set, which would obviously be bad for cyber, would be bad for cyber escalation or cyber attacks. Uh, the last card I'll talk about um, is the Horowitz card. And this says, this is uh this essentially says that the plan would entangle uh NATO and NATO member countries into con into conflicts because some threats of cyber attack could be unsubstantiated and if an Article Five response is obligated in that in that instance it could force NATO into conflicts that it shouldn't be involved in um, and it also says that ambiguity creates wiggle room as to sort of respond to these unsubstantiated threats, right? That if it's unclear exactly what would trigger an Article 5 response, that instead of it being a collective, a uh, question of collective NATO action, it could just be a question of, well, what does the individual country or set of countries that got cyber attacked, what do they individually do and not what does NATO as a whole organization do? Um, so in general, this turn is essentially arguing that yes, um, cyber attacks are bad and can lead to bad things, but that the AF actually would result in more cyber attacks and not less cyber attacks, uh, partly because uh, it would undermine alliances and also just that in general ambiguity is in fact good um, for deterring cyber attacks because uh, for multiple different reasons. Does that sort of Again, concludes the up to the one and C of the case. You'll notice that I didn't talk about the two AC evidence. 
Um, we can talk about that more in Q and A um, if you all want. But essentially, what I wanted to do was to make sure that everybody got the basics of the affirmative and the negative arguments um, coming out of this, so that everybody knows what democratic peace theory is or knows uh, what it means to like trigger an Article Five response. So at this point, I will open the floor to any questions um, that people have about the stuff that I've talked about. Um, and then afterwards, we can sort of go into um, Alicia's portion of the DDC. OK, so now we're going to talk about the international law disadvantage, which is specific to the cyber AF. So to start off, I just want to recap real quick the structure of a disadvantage. You all are probably familiar with this if you are at the point where you're using this disadvantage. But uh, just as a reminder, we have our uniqueness, which says that, you know, which defines whatever the status quo or the current way of the world is, which says it's OK as long as we don't change things. The link says, hey, the plan changed things. That's not good. The internal link kind of explains how that change gets us, like all the steps that get us from that one change the plan made to something bad that ultimately happens, and that bad thing is the impact. So for this disadvantage, normally you all would get distinct pieces of evidence for like uniqueness, link, impact, blah, blah, blah. For this one, you have a unique link, so the uniqueness and link in one piece of evidence, another link card, the internal link, and the impact. So there's no standalone piece of uniqueness evidence, uh, but it is in there. So some important concepts to understand uh, when you're thinking about this disadvantage are kind of like, uh, like what is the United Nations or the UN? So this is like the largest international organization in the world that uh, is generally accepted as having authority over how member countries or just countries in general interact with each other. It has 193 member countries. So it is much bigger than NATO, which has about 30 countries. Uh, and instead of just being like, okay, this is an alliance of you know, a handful of countries with the same mission. This is kind of like trying to affect kind of everyone as much as possible. And it has the general goal of kind of preventing war. It was founded uh, in 1945 after World War II. And their whole thing is that they're kind of just like, yeah, we never want to have a war again, a world war. So the UN Security Council is a specific branch of the UN, specifically an executive branch that is in charge of peacekeeping and security. Uh, so they have a similar law to Article 5 that NATO has, but, you know, uh, that they're in charge of. They get to, they can both like uh, tell member states to do things uh, and they can decide whether those should be like military measures or non-military measures like economic sanctions versus like okay time to send some soldiers uh, and the it is kind of its operations are undergone by or its decisions are made by uh, a handful of countries, only 15. There's five permanent members who we will talk about when we get to the 2AC section, but it's like a very small group that's kind of in charge of all of the peacekeeping and security stuff. And then the last thing I want to talk about is use of force. This is kind of referring to, you'll see uh, use of first force and no first use referred to a lot in this part of the evidence. And this is all referring to what we should consider an armed attack. So if you have been the victim of an armed attack, then under international law, uh, according to the UN, you are allowed to uh, act in self-defense versus, you know, when they're like, no, 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 you need to figure this out without like, you know, going to war. So again, that kind of thing where it's like, oh, do you just do economic sanctions? Do you try to do some diplomatic things? Do you just do a bunch of kind of non-military means of resolving conflict? Or are you allowed to like start firing weapons and deploying troops? So there's two general camps about where cyber attacks fall with use of force and armed attacks. One camp is just like, yeah, cyber attacks are pretty much never going to reach the status of an armed attack. And the other camp is that if it is severe enough, kind of if it meet, is that certain cyber attacks can meet the threshold, kind of like what the cyber AF in the 1AC is talking about. So there's two camps on this. One is that both are just different interpretations of the same uh, law that the UN has that's kind of like their version of Article 5 uh, that pretty much that one says no cyber attacks cannot be armed attacks and one says yes they can under the right circumstances. So let's jump into our evidence breakdown. So this first piece of evidence is from Goodman. It is the unique link. So it says, information warfare is not an armed attack. The plan's definition of cyber thresholds lowers the line for breaking international law. So 
the uniqueness part of this is pretty much saying that cyber attacks are only considered armed attacks if they directly cause death or destruction. You'll see the phrase non-destructive cyber attacks throughout this disad. Uh, so this just includes any cyber attacks that don't directly cause death or destruction. So even if it is a malicious or hostile cyber attack, it does not count as destructive if it does not meet that specific uh, point. So the uniqueness part says, no, it has to be cause. It has to directly cause death or destruction. That's what it means when it says proximate is directly or immediately. Uh, and then the link part is saying that invoking self-defense against cyber attacks like election hacking would violate international law. A lot of the evidence throughout here when it refers to cyber attacks will refer to things that the affirmative is thinking about, like election hacking, like uh, just spreading misinformation, those kinds of cyber attacks. So. The next piece of evidence from Michael Schmidt uh, is a piece of link evidence. And first, I just want to say that Michael Schmidt is like the expert on how international law should regard should or could regard cyber attacks uh, and has been writing original analysis on it since 1999 and has like put out a lot of evidence on this. So and even has like a seven parameter based like way of determining whether or not cyber attacks should be considered armed attacks. So this is a very qualified author uh, for this piece of evidence. But uh, this piece of evidence, a specific one specifically uh, looks at kind of, it has an analysis uh, based on what Russia has been doing since the invasion on Ukraine and what they might do as the war continues uh, and says that, you know, looking at all of that, this analysis kind of concludes that any cyber attacks by Russia against NATO, we probably should not be classifying as armed attacks under the current legal framework. So that's why this card is saying that uh, neighbor, NATO's cyber collective defense sets a legal framework for the concept of armed attack, because if we suddenly change it, like the way it is now, it does not count as armed attack. And if we respond using Article 5 of NATO, we would be changing the legal framework for what counts as an armed attack, because what Russia has been doing and is likely to do in the future would not is not something that uh, likely would actually reach the current thresholds. The third piece of evidence is an internal link, also from Schmidt, but in 2014. Uh, and it pretty much says that defining cyber attacks as armed attacks would dramatically change the accepted interpretation of international law, specifically Article 51 of the UN Charter. That's their equivalent of Article 5, uh, and justify early use of force. So this specific piece of evidence uh, talks about how if we had responded to a specific Russian cyber attack, it would have been really bad and horrible and destabilizing. Uh, and this would essentially mean like, we would go from, I can't bomb you unless you bomb me to I can bomb you because you hacked a company from my country. Like imagine if we had responded to an attack on the company Sony by going to war with Russia or like firing a nuke, that would be ridiculous, right? Uh, so the argument here is that, yeah, it's just like would really just ruin international law, specifically Article 51, if we were to actually respond to Russian cyber attacks as they've actually been happening uh, with a use of force. And one thing to just uh, note about uh, Schmidt's model for figuring out use of force is that it is there is no like blanket, concrete, yes, no, bright line that works. So kind of like the clear red lines that uh, the app talks about establishing, Schmidt's model doesn't really incorporate that. Uh, or Schmidt's model doesn't really agree with the idea of you can have a clear yes, no on cyber attacks uh, because it's always dependent on the specific situation on if it's a use of force. And one of the things that we'll do after we get through the lectures is actually talk about like what different kinds of cyber attacks could look like and think about like, do we think they should constitute a use of force? And finally, the impact from Worth 2017 uh, is pretty much saying that the whole point of the United Nations is to implement international laws that prevent armed conflict. So the long piece that this evidence refers to when it says destabilizing international law collapses the long piece and risk global conflict uh, refers to the period starting after World War II where we were generally thinking, okay, we are not in a huge global armed conflict anymore. So if we change international law to make the early use of force, so not being able to, so like changing it from the typical self-defense laws that we have right now, uh, to justify that early use of force undermines the whole point of NATO and it makes conflict more likely. Because if we kind of just say, well, we're going to reinterpret the laws to kind of fit what we want to do militarily with 
uh, Article 51 in terms of cyber, then it just makes uh, conflict way easier. It kind of just gets rid of the whole point of having these laws in the first place, which is to make conflict less likely. So this piece of evidence specifically talks about war with North Korea, China, and Russia being more likely in this world where we kind of don't care about international law anymore. So now we're going to talk about kind of what responses the affirmative can make against uh, this disadvantage. So the first piece of evidence is uh, making a non-unique argument. It's from Davis 2018. And I want to say, if you are following along or whenever you do have your packet, you're going to want to add to this first piece of evidence uh, the word no to the tag. So it says, first, non-unique, states have independent understandings of cyber law. There is universal norm. You want that to say there is no universal norm because that is the argument this piece of evidence is making. So with that in mind that there is no universal norm, uh, this is pretty much saying like, no, there's not a clear understanding right now on uh, what cyber attacks count as what. So because the UN is an international organization over a bunch of independent countries, every country can, can decide you know, on its own or have different understandings about what counts as what in terms of cyber attacks. So there is no widely accepted norm from the UN, like the one NC says. So different countries uh, consider different kinds of cyber operations and cyber attacks uh, peaceful or not meeting certain thresholds versus hostile. So that's kind of ridiculous to say like, oh no, you've ruined international law by establishing this bad bright line when nobody, when it's not changing things from a kind of understood norm right now. The next thing uh, is a no link argument from Verkazi 2018. So it says non-destructive cyber operations can be use of force under international law. So this says, no, 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 the plan is not changing the threshold because uh, it already counts. So it says that, so the one NC says death and destruction is the standard for use of force for cyber attacks. And this one says, no, it's not because there was a case in Nicaragua that uh, the UN's division that includes a court found that uh, arming and training guerrilla fighters who were engaged in conflict with another country was a use of force. And it, and this card basically says, well, if we use that same logic, then like, you know, if a country provided malware to some group and then trained that group on how to use the malware and then they used it against another state, that would also be a use of force. Though, so this pretty much says like, well, if we just like extrapolate conventional armed attack logic, to uh, cyber attacks, then non-destructive use of force is a thing. And so we should be allowed to do this without violating international law. Though it is important to note, this is especially useful if you are the neg, uh, that this evidence is just applying the logic of this Nicaragua case to cyber attacks. There is no historical precedent for the UN finding that non-destructive cyber attacks were a use of force. And in fact, a lot of the 1NC evidence, if you look closely at it, goes into specific cases where Russia did a cyber attack and then uh, the UN or whatever expert was like, no, this definitely did not justify a use of force. And it's good that we did not respond with force because that would have been ridiculous. The third thing that we have here is a no impact card from Yusuf in 2022. Uh, and these no impact cards that we're about to talk about pretty much just say the UN is useless. The US, the UN is really bad at its job. It has never been good at it. So if we look, if we go all the way back to 1945 till now, there have been so many armed conflicts that international law has not prevented. And even uh, though we've talked mostly about international law, like the UN Security Council has other powers to kind of try to uh, resolve conflicts like they can deploy, they can like mobilize militaries, they can deploy troops uh, on peace envoys and missions that they've had. And even, and there's lots of examples of things that even that, in addition to international law didn't stop, even when the UN Security Council was like, all right, mobilize the troops, didn't do anything to actually stop the conflict. Like there are places where the UN has sent troops in and those troops have come home and the conflict is still ongoing. So this just lists a bunch of examples where it's just like, so it's pretty much just saying, yeah, the UN does not actually stop any conflicts. They never have been good at it. And then finally, our second no impact argument from Biswas 2022 has starts off with the same argument that the UN is useless. It has never been a good at stopping conflict. But then it also goes further and says that countries really don't take the UN seriously because of these failures. And even goes as far as to say like five countries in particular, the big five can do whatever they want without worrying about what the UN thinks or what UN uh, resolutions or international law says, because they can veto 
literally any UN Security Council resolution that they don't like. So the big five refers to the five permanent member countries on the UN Security Council, and those are the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China. So two of the three countries cited in the 1NC impact evidence can veto anything the UN Security Council tries to pass. And it's not something where it's like, okay, you need a majority of the five to veto something. Any of the five can veto anything all on their own. So there is like no way that conflict with Russia or China necessarily becomes more likely because, or you know, China's big ally, North Korea, because we changed an understanding of a UN law because they already don't really have to worry about what the UN law says. And even if you're not on the big five, no one really cares anyway. So that is the crux of the international law disadvantage and the affirmative arguments against it. All right, I'm going to open things up to questions now. All right, let me pause real quick. Mm -hmm.